Thank you, Maddox, Mr. Zander. Are you good? That's a, that's a challenging one. But you are. Today we celebrate that, that you are good. Not only good, you're holy. It's kind of difficult to celebrate uh, things that started like 500 plus years ago. We really don't understand what was going on 500 plus years ago. It's kind of hard to celebrate something that happened 200 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. But today we have the privilege and opportunity to celebrate the Festival of the Reformation. And maybe there's lots of that that we don't get, but we typically know it has something to do with Martin Luther. And um, I want to talk about his experience this morning uh, and the whole thing about being good. <laughs> How I started, what was the Reformation really about? Martin Luther entered into the monastery, became a monk, later became a priest, kind of because of a, a deal, at least that's the legend, that's, that's a theory that we have. They always talk about Luther almost died in a storm uh, with all kinds of lightning and stuff, and he was so scared that he's gonna die, he made a deal with God. If you get me through this storm, I will become a priest. That's not really a great reason for becoming a priest, but we probably all have made deals with God at one point in time or another. God, if you get me through this, I will do that. Now, most of the time we forget five minutes afterwards what we said we would do for God after he saved us, but, but Luther didn't. I don't know what kind of a Christian he was if, if he went to Mass all the time. I'm assuming he was a, a good Christian. That, that, that would be my guess. I'm guessing his mom and dad were good Christians. But I do know that when he decided to become a priest, his dad thought, I really wish you'd become a lawyer. Now, I'm not sure if that was because lawyers made a lot more money than priests. Um, but there, there were struggles. So what made Luther so intent to be faithful as a Christian? Simple, it was fear. It was fear that he wasn't good enough. It was fear that drove him to enter the monastery. It was fear that drove him, caused him to become a pastor. <laughs> and what was interesting is the harder Luther tried, the more he tried to be the faithful Christian that he wanted to be, he wanted to honor God, the more he tried to do that, the more he saw that he failed. The harder he worked at being a Christian, the more he said, well, I, but I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And I had bad thoughts here. And, and, and the more he worked at it, the more frightened, the more frustrated he became. And it drove him to try even harder to be faithful to God. Now, it's interesting because that which drove him out of fear to try to do better caused everybody else to look at him and say, wow, what a Christian you are, Luther. And so they raised him up. They kept promoting him. And they kept promoting him to the point where he was a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. He kept working so hard. They said, you're such a great Christian and you're so smart and you can work harder than anybody else. We'll keep promoting. And it was here that God touched his life with grace, not fear. And it was in preparing a lecture on Romans chapter 3, our epistle, our reading for this morning. A reading that, that we can say Luther understood very well. We know whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, no bragging, and the whole world be held accountable to God. No one gets through without answering to God. 
For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And Luther goes, ah, there's no way I can ever do this. The Bible says you'll never be justified by the law. But I don't know how it was. You know, there's all kinds of things I find in the Bible today that I've read many times before and I never noticed them. I don't know how it was that Luther missed this part before. Maybe it was because it didn't fit his way of thinking. But then he read, now the righteousness of God has been manifested, has been shown apart from the law. Oh, that's different. The righteousness of God, that which I've been chasing after for so long, so hard, it's been shown a different way to get it. The law and the prophets bear testimony, bear witness to this righteousness. The Bible bears testimony. That's what the, the law and the prophets are. It's the Old Testament. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Luther had no problem believing. And his life was changed. The word of God has power. It has tremendous power. And I want you to understand when we celebrate the Reformation, this isn't a thing about denominations. This is about, first and foremost, Luther being set free, as the gospel reading from John said, set free through the truth that there's a righteousness that God gave to him, one that he did not earn or deserve, one that he could not earn or deserve. It was amazing. And everything changed for him. Everything changed. I want to read to you a quote from Luther about this passage. He writes, I hated the expression righteousness of God since I had been instructed to understand as that by which God proves himself righteous by punishing sinners and the unjust. That's how I saw the righteousness of God. God punishes us because we're not righteous. And the more he punishes, the more we realize how righteous God is. He says, but I began to understand that the gospel revelation was the righteousness of God in a passive sense. That righteousness through which the merciful God justifies us by faith. Then I felt as if I had been completely reborn and had entered paradise through widely opened doors. Instantly, all scripture looked different to me. As intensely as I had formerly hated the expression righteousness of God, I now loved and praised it as the sweetest of concepts. And so this passage of Paul actually was the portal of paradise to me. Fascinating. The Reformation begins as an intensely personal thing for Martin Luther and really for us. Thus, what we celebrate isn't uh, we're better than the Catholics or the Baptists or whatever. It's, it's not, denominations are not something that's really a good thing. Uh, it's, I don't think God is happy that we've divided all Christians into different camps. It's a necessary thing because we struggle to understand what is the truth, but it's certainly not what we celebrate. What we celebrate is the grace of God that gives you and me a righteousness that we can never get on our own. Now, what's interesting with this is, what did that do to Luther? It spurred him on to try all the harder, to work all the more, not to get something, not to get somewhere, not to achieve righteousness, 
but so that the world might realize the great truth that he had learned that he had never seen before. So Luther translated the Bible, um, Old New Testaments from Hebrew and Greek to, to German so that the people of his nation could read the Bible for themselves. Because I'm sure there was as many people then that spoke and could read Hebrew and Greek as there are in this congregation today. He worked to open the, the truths of God to the vernacular of the people. He did that with hymns as well. He used hymns to, to teach these lessons of the Bible because it's easier when you sing things to remember what they are, what they say. And yes, he did debate and work I don't want to say fight, but he fought for the truth within the church. He never tried to start a new church, a new denomination. That only happened because the old church kicked him and everybody aligned with him out of the church. But these are the truths that he came to see. Sola fide. It's only by faith. You're saved by faith, through grace. Sola scriptures. The truth that we have comes only from the Bible, not from anywhere else. So the gratia, only by grace. It's so simple. All that work, Luther said, that I've been trying to do, it did me nothing. But there's nothing that I could do. God simply gave his love and declared me to be righteous. That we celebrate. Or do we? Do we really celebrate the Reformation? This is my Confirmation Bible. I won't tell you what year I got it. It's in pretty good shape, though, although there, there are some oil from my hand that got on this. You know, the one interesting thing is I went to look for this Bible this week. The only thing I remembered about the Bible was it was original water buffalo calfskin leather. I think. Let's see. Water buffalo calfskin leather line. Yeah. Now that's a Bible, isn't it? That's a Bible. Not just leather. This is water buffalo calfskin leather. This was a special Bible. Other than that, I could probably get a good price for it because it really hasn't been used much at all. Um, and there was too long in my life that I was more impressed that it was calfskin, water buffalo calfskin leather than I was with anything that God said to me in this book. I think there's something for us to learn. The same experience that Luther had is one that God has given to us. And Satan wants us to kind of gloss over that and not fall to our knees because of it. God revealed the wonderful truth of grace to Luther. That day when he read in Romans chapter 3, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to us through Jesus Christ. This righteousness is made, is given to us by faith in Jesus. It changed his life. And thank God it changed the church. And you and I have benefited from that. But we all have had our own grace experiences, our own surprise moments when God touches us in a way that we're not really expecting it. Every single one of us. Think about this. Your first experience happened a long time before you were ever born. When Jesus died on the cross, he was thinking of you. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? When you were washed in the waters of baptism, maybe you were too young to, when you were baptized to remember that at all, but when you were washed in the waters of baptism, everything that was of Jesus, is of Jesus, was given to you. As God declared you to be his child. Now that's a grace experience. But I'm sure there's some 
experiences of grace that you've had in your own life. This was Luther's. I don't know how many people he told about that story, about when I read Romans chapter three in a different way for the first time. Wow, it changed my whole life. And they're not all simply reading the Bible, but they come from truths in the Bible. I think of mine. I have a number of different ones, as, as do you. I was just trying to think, what would be appropriate today? I think at a time, uh, there was a guy named Craig who was working with me and uh, working through some difficult things in my life. And, and um, And when things got tough, he could have just walked away from me because Craig was a, as a coach, actually, that I hired. And I said, things are tough, and uh, I don't have money to pay you anymore. So Craig in Texas, although he grew up in Rochester Hills, so I guess there's a Michigan connection. Craig in Texas says, that's okay. I'll stand by you. So for a whole year, he still worked with me, still supported me. And, and he always had this way of saying, all right, I'm not going to join your pity party. So here's the problem. What are you going to do about it? I believe that God has raised you up to be able to do this. Because he loves you and he's gifted you. And I'm always going to be grateful to Craig for teaching me that lesson of grace. Simply by his act of standing with me. This morning, let's not talk about Luther's or any of my stories. This morning, I want you to think through. What's your grace experience? How has God surprised you with grace? And let's be honest here. If we haven't been surprised by grace, we don't understand grace. If it doesn't drive me to my knees, I don't get it. If it's not a story that I want people to know, to hear about the greatness of the God who's loved me, then I miss something. So you and I can't sit here and say, well, that's fine, but that's kind of dumb. No, it's not dumb. It is our lives. It is what we celebrate today. Not Luther's experience, not my experience, but our experience. Sometimes collectively, as a church, God has blessed in this place. Sometimes individually. So I want you to take a couple minutes. Well, just a minute. When did God surprise you with grace? And I want you to think, who are you going to tell this week? Maybe it's somebody that doesn't know grace. Maybe you just want to practice on your husband or your wife or your children or your parents. I don't care. Think about it. A moment of grace in your life when you saw the depth of God's love for you. And who are you going to tell this week? Let's do that now.